Hey there. How's it going? How you doing? Welcome everybody into this Elden Ring guide. This is going to be a very straight to the point ultimate guide for Elden Ring. Maybe it's been a little bit since you've played or perhaps you're a brand new tarnished and you've never played this game at all, but you're interested in it to prepare for the DLC and get your hands in on that. So today I'm going to show you how to go from this to this. We're going to bring you from Maidenless to uh, Hugh Hefner, essentially. So anyways, if it's been a little while since you've played Elden Ring or you've never played this game at all, stick with me. We're going to go over all the systems of the game, talk about the essential items that you'll need and how to prepare for the DLC. So just sit back and relax. This is going to be your ultimate guide to Elden Ring. So let's start at the beginning where everybody's going to begin at the character creation screen. When it comes to selecting your class, the only thing you need to think about is how this is going to affect your playstyle or choosing the one that most fits your preferences. If you go for something like Vagabond, this is going to be for more melee builds, you know, straight swords, great swords, things of that nature. If you want to play, you know, different sorcery builds or magic builds, you can absolutely do that too. spec into more things like faith or intelligence. But basically, you can see all different kinds of stats here, and there's a little bit of strength and trade-offs depending on who you pick unless you pick the the the, the guy now if you already have a character uh, that you've played the game with maybe then this part is not relevant to you this is for people who are beginning and selecting a new character obviously this is most important in the early game and you will get the ability later to respec your stats we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later in the video so if you find that you don't like a particular play style or you don't like the weapons that come along with that you can completely respec the stats giving you access to different weapon classes spells incantations you name it but what we'll talk about really quick is what uh, essentially roughly each stat does does. The first stat category here is Vigor, and this is your HP bar, probably one of the most important stats for Elden Ring. Mind is your maximum HP stat, or your blue bar, that allows you to cast spells or incantations. Green is your Endurance, and this can play into how much equipment you can carry, but also, you know, how much you can roll and sprint and things of that nature. And then Strength, Dexterity, Intelligence, Faith, and Arcane are all sort of these multipliers that affect uh, the scaling of your weapon, and so what that means is like big old great swords like this usually scale with strength as that would kind of make sense whereas katanas can scale with something like dex you can check what your weapon scales with and we'll talk about that later this will determine what sort of build you should be running you can further break these two down into subcategories strength and dex are more or less for melee builds whereas intelligence and faith are more or less for magic builds now there are exceptions to that of course you know those weapons that scale with dex and arcane for example but those we'll talk about when we get into more complex builds of the game but for for now, you have your character and you're entering the intro of the game. And so let's talk about what you should do in the first like couple of hours. So as soon as you begin the game, you should have your character. We're going to walk across this bridge into this section and fight our first boss. You're going to absolutely get clapped, but that's fine. Don't worry about it. Even if you kill the boss, you're still going to die because that's how the game has to start. But as soon as that happens, you're going to get a cutscene. You're going to wake up in these catacombs and you're going to walk through the tutorial section of the game, kill a couple of easy enemies and learn the basic systems of combat. After you've done that, you're going to also get probably your first first golden seed. This will become important later when we talk about flasks. Also, I don't know why Elden Ring did this, but you're gonna have to fight the Soldier of Godric, which is one of the hardest enemies in the whole game. I mean, this guy, uh, He's probably going to whoop your ass. But also, you're going to notice as you go up the catacombs, you're going to see this dungeon over here on the right side that needs a stone sword key. This is an item that can be obtained in the open world or through vendors. You'll come across quite a few of these throughout your playthrough, but please keep in mind of this dungeon. Take note of it because it has one of the best items in the game for casting spells and incantations. But uh, just remember where this is. But anyways, as you go up the lift here and into Limgrave, you're going to be greeted with this giant, vast open world. And then you need to walk forward and talk to the guy that tells you you have no maidens after that you're gonna be like i don't really know what i'm doing but i'm just gonna run around you're probably gonna get smoked once or twice by the tree sentinel You can try to brute force this over and over again and beat him, but if you're having a hard time with this, just continue forward, run past him into the church, and touch this side of grace. You're going to talk to Melina. After that one is done, what we're also going to do is go touch the other side of grace that is near the gate. This will give you access to Torrent and the ability to level up. This is huge because Torrent allows you to traverse the open world much quicker, and the ability to level up and turn your runes into more stats is, of course, how you're going to just fundamentally uh, make a better character in this game. So once you've leveled up a little bit, 
you can maybe explore one or two of these dungeons and kill these easy bosses you should be getting your confidence up a little bit maybe uh beef up your stats to some extent and then maybe you can try the tree sentinel again or or maybe just die again However, if this guy's whooping your ass too much, don't worry about it as you now have access to the fundamental aspects of leveling up. So you can just go and explore the world, get more runes, kill easier enemies, and continue to level up. And eventually, you're going to start to be able to match him. Eventually, you'll be able to walk up and absolutely manhandle the tree sentinel, and maybe you'll find some better weapons along the way. Remember that anytime you enter a new area, as you explore, your map will be blacked out. You won't be able to see anything, but occasionally there will be this glowing yellow dot that you'll want to take yourself to, and that is the location for the map of that section which will fully fill it in and allow you to know where you're going keep in mind as you're slowly exploring Limgrave, you can use your already acquired sites of grace to fast travel and also you can acquire these golden seeds that will be located on these trees and also if you find a church generally they will have a sacred tier and these are two very necessary items having a certain amount of golden seeds will add another flask to your overall selection and then the sacred tier will make them even more effective and uh, increase the charge of them keep in mind you can also completely spec how you want these to be laid out you can have uh maybe just one fp flask and the rest for hp however you want to do it this is very build dependent and just personal preference i tend to you know gravitate more towards hp but that's just me at some point when you come back to this site of grace at the church you're going to notice a dark mist will enshroud the area and this will be your first encounter with rena she's going to talk to you a little bit and also give you the spirit ash calling bell this will allow you to use summons inside of boss fights and other challenging areas summons are an entirely optional mechanic you can use these to help you in boss fights or you cannot it doesn't really matter you'll probably gather a lot of spirit ashes throughout your playthrough but whether you choose to engage with this system or not is entirely your choice you can use summons or not it, it doesn't matter now with this knowledge you should be armed to take on pretty much all of limgrave and even beyond uh, maybe you've explored a little bit gathered some new items and weapons and you want to know how to utilize these properly maybe you've gotten some new boss stuff that you want to know how to take advantage of so now let's talk about how to upgrade your weapons and take advantage of the ashes of war this is essentially the bread and butter of how you make a better weapon in elden ring so essentially think of weapons in two different categories you have normal ones and you have more specialized weapons the normal weapons can be upgraded using regular smithing stones now these are going to be items that you'll find just as you're playing mostly they can be found in caves if you find a little secret cave or dungeon they're typically in there you know on the wall or you'll get them as a reward you'll probably find a lot of these smithing stones they come one through nine and then you have an ancient smithing stone which is like the special one to bring a weapon to max level keep in mind you can also get an item called a smithing stone ball bearing and this allows you to take this item to the round table hold that you'll eventually unlock and you can give it to a vendor here and this will allow you to buy unlimited uh, versions of that stone I do recommend getting all the ball bearings for just about everything because it makes all of your vending and trying to buy items way easier just trust me on that go out of your way to get these ball bearings it will be worth it but anyways this is essentially how you upgrade normal weapons special ones are a bit different as they require somber smithing stones while they're not totally different uh, in the way that you acquire them they're also found in caves and whatnot they can be a little rarer and also this will require an ancient somber smithing stone in order to fully upgrade it just depends on the weapon that you want to use so if you have decided on a weapon already and if it requires let's say somber ones then you're going to probably want to go out of your way to acquire as many of those as possible now as a side note if you are going to to decide to use spirit ashes and summons you may come across this item called a ghost glove ward and these work the same way as smithing stones but for your spirit ashes you can go over to this lady here at the round table hold and she'll use these you know plants and items to upgrade some of your spirit ashes of choice works the exact same way as weapons do okay so now it's going to get a little bit more complex as we talk about ashes of war this is the system that allows your weapon to have a different ability even if it's the same weapon typically it can be applied with a different ash of war and that will give it different properties including what it scales with so you need to be a little bit mindful about what you're running as you're looking through them you can always check what it's going to do to your weapon so for example like some of these will reduce its overall base damage but increase the weapons fire damage or something like that and maybe that will scale differently with uh, the stats that you have with arcane or faith or intelligence whatever it may be this is where it gets a little bit tricky and this is where the build crafting comes into play what I'm going to recommend here is that if you're using a normal weapon just try to focus on one or two attributes for your weapon scaling you know if you're 
you're using like a big great sword, it's probably going to scale with something like dex and strength, most likely. But also, please bear in mind, there are two extremely important items that you'll need to really take advantage of being able to change your weapon's property. The uh, wet blade and the iron wet blade, I'll go ahead and put them up on screen where these can be found. These items will allow you to really get into the smithing of the weapon. The iron wet blade will allow you to apply stuff like heavy and keen and quality, which will again change the attribute scaling depending on what you want to do. But as you can see here, my katana that has a dex requirement applying a spinning slash ash of war and then applying a cult to that one makes it scale with arcane so it makes sense to fully upgrade uh, arcane and keep leveling into that as it will increase the damage output of my weapon and that's for a normal weapon so these are a bit more flexible but now i can show you something like the moonlight greatsword which is a special weapon with a baked in ash of war and this uh, has a strength requirement to be able to use, but scales with intelligence. So ranking that up will allow that to have a higher damage output. But that's a little crash course on weapon upgrading. You can keep it simple and basic, or you can get very complex with different Ashes of War. Uh, if, honestly, if you want to keep it simple, use a special weapon because they typically have a baked in one and the uh, uh, attribute scaling requirements are usually pretty straightforward. Now to wrap back to the dungeon we were talking about earlier, there is an item inside of this that's practically the best finger seal you can find. This is the Dragon Communion Seal, and it's generally regarded as the best one, and I would certainly recommend going after it, because this is the item that allows you to use spells. You know, you'll probably gather a bunch of them as you're exploring. You'll find them in caves. You can maybe learn them from NPCs and stuff like that. You might have some really cool ones, and you'll need one of these Finger Seals in order to actually use them at all, and I do recommend getting and upgrading the Dragon Communion Seal. It's very, very good. Additionally, when it comes to further upgrading your character and cultivating a specific play style and build, you can take this even further with the addition of talismans you'll have four slots inside of your uh, you know inventory category and then you'll also have something called great runes these great runes will be acquired after defeating main bosses in the game and can be restored through certain towers now here's the thing though with great runes i'm gonna let you know right now godrix is the best i mean just straight up i mean like outside of a couple really specific scenarios just run godrix it's it's by far like the greatest. Using a great rune and then applying this simply raises all attributes. It just flat out makes you better. And there's really nothing uh, more advantageous than that in Elden Ring. So I would recommend using Godric's great rune, although you'll probably acquire many of them throughout your playthrough of the game. But you'll also have your talisman slots. And again, these are a lot more build dependent, but also I'm gonna give you a couple that I just think are straight up some of the best in the game. This includes stuff like Alexander's Jar Shard. This actually increases the damage that using your Ashes of War will output this is really good especially if you're constantly using that ability on your weapon it's just extremely practical you're going to be using it all the time and it's flat out one of the best talismans it will require you to complete alexander's quest line but is certainly worth the effort to get it i also really like the green turtle talisman this is where it can be found and uh this allows your stamina to recover much faster this is good for just general combat you know moment to moment gameplay this essentially allows more actions per minute including rolling and that's very important we're going to talk about that in just a second but the last talisman that i absolutely do recommend is radagon's sword seal this is where it can be located it's actually pretty easy to get and it does basically what godric's great rune does it raises all your attributes but unfortunately it does slightly increase the damage that you take so stacked with godric's great rune you can be outputting some wicked damage but you will be taking a little bit more in return which uh, to me is a completely fair trade-off there are literally hundreds of different talismans in the game and i just recommend that you experiment and get creative with the ones you have but these three are just very practical ones that I absolutely recommend for just about any build now let's quickly talk about rolling because this is one of your most important defensive options and it does play a little bit into how your gear is and so we talked about how the green turtle talisman allows you to roll more unless you're running just like a pure tank build with a big old shield rolling is your number one thing in order to avoid damage essentially and so it needs to be light and nimble and you'll notice that inside of your character screen you have a number for poise and also whatever your load is you'll have a light medium or heavy load and so you're going to want to stay in the range of light to medium if you're running heavy then basically you're going to have what's called a fat roll meaning you have a lot less invincibility when you're rolling again unless you're running a big tank build with a giant shield i wouldn't recommend fat rolling at all so you never want that to be in heavy now honestly though there's not much difference between a light and a medium roll so i i wouldn't really stress about always trying to be in light i i typically prefer medium and it also 
uh, will affect how your poise function is. So these kind of go hand in hand. The heavier your gear, usually the more your poise. And what this does is the ability to knock down enemies faster. If you're fighting big bosses, the higher your poise, the more likely they are to get knocked down for you to get a critical hit. So it's a bit of a trade-off relationship there. But I just recommend staying somewhere in your gear from light to medium. This will allow you to roll as much as possible and have the most amount of iframes during combat. At a certain moment in the game, you're going to get given a mixed physic. This is an additional flask that's separate to your other two. And this allows you to customize what this does. And this can range anything from restoring half your health to restoring HP over time, maybe giving you more FP uh, or restoring your stamina faster, giving you more poise, like whatever. There's hundreds of functions that these can do, and you can customize these to your liking. There's a couple of special ones for certain bosses, which we won't get into, but basically just get in the habit of collecting these. You can mix and match them at any point, and if you are facing a particularly tough or challenging area or enemy, you can cater these to your liking, and they're very fun to experiment with. So a couple of really good ones that I recommend are these like Crimson Burst ones that just restore your health. It's like having a free extra HP flask, and I think it's really nice for the game. But now let's go over a very important and quick list of some key items that you're going to need to traverse the entire map. So there's a couple of medallions in the game, and some you get given during story moments, and some you need to go out of your way to get. The first one is going to be the Dectus Medallion, and this has two halves. The first one can be found in uh, Fort Height, which is in Limgrave. It's a pretty easy one to get to in the early game. Over here on the right side, you'll get one half there, and then the other one is inside of Fort Faroth inside of Kaelid. These are a little bit tricky to get to compared to uh, the, the first one, but getting these two secret medallion pieces, this will make your life a hell of a lot easier later in your playthrough, so please go out of your way in the early game to just get this taken care of. You can knock these out very fast, and it will serve you later on. Now, the other item we're going to get after defeating Godric, and once you're in the Lyurnia section of the game, is the Glintstone Key that will give you access to Rhea Lucaria. There's a certain magic gate that needs the key, and this can be located behind a dragon in this section of the map. You'll walk up to him, the dragon will kind of fly away, you don't even need to fight him, he'll move, you can grab this key and then bounce, and this will give you access to the Academy, which will be very helpful later. Now, the other item is actually the Secret Medallion. This is going to be absolutely necessary if you want to fight stuff like Melenia, get access to the DLC, and go to Moog's Palace. Now, the Secret Medallion pieces, one of them can be acquired in the village of the Albernax, or whatever, they're, I think I said that right. Anyways, doesn't matter. Let me show you how to get here because this one can be a bit tricky to find. Starting from Lyurnia, we're going to hang to the left side here and eventually you're going to go down this path and then you're going to kind of fork off at the road here and it's going to be a cave that sort of goes up into this side of the mountain. It's very tricky to find because it doesn't show up easily on the map, but you'll just want to hang to the left and eventually you'll be get given this spot. And so once you make it here, you're going to go up the hill and there's going to be a guy that's like in this barrel or this jar and you talk to him, he's going to give you the uh, secret medallion piece. Now, the other half of this is actually found once you make it to the mountaintop of the Giants area, which is pretty near the late game. It's over here, and this is inside of Castle Soul. I'll go ahead and mark it on the map for you. You're going to want to clear this area, defeat the boss, and once you make it to the top of the castle, there will be a uh, overhang, and then you're going to find the other piece of the secret medallion here. This, again, will be useful later on. Now, the other item we're going to go for is both an essential and also optional item, but it's like practically the best summon that everybody wants. This is the Mimic tier. I'm going to show you exactly where to get this. After defeating Radon at a point in the game, you're going to get access to the underground city in Limgrave, and this will be a big meteor in the ground. You can go down this area, and then it will access an entirely new section of the map. Once you're down here, there is a site of grace that you can get, and then you'll run down this palace and then into this door, and you'll uh, have to fight a version of yourself. This is not how you get the Mimic tier, but once you complete this area, we're going to run over uh, past this bridge, and then we're going to go down this section. You're going to need to jump down a bunch of these buildings through these windows. I'm just going to show you a very direct path here, and then eventually it's going to take you to a certain chest, and upon opening this, you'll be given the Mimic tier. Now, what this does is summon an, an identical version of you. It's just a Spirit Ash that copies your exact stats and weapons, so you can bring another version of yourself in. And again, this can be upgraded, can be really OP uh, if you upgrade it properly, and can be used for boss fights and stuff like that if you're having a hard time. Again, completely optional, though. You don't have to use it if 
if you don't want, but it is a key item for people who want to use Spirit Ashes. So at this point, you should have a pretty good understanding of the game and a grasp on what you're doing. And if you've even unlocked the mountaintop of the Giants area, you may notice that there's an entire different section of the map that you can't walk to. Like this whole left side uh, looks like you can play on it, but you can't get to it from any way. It's too far down. The way you access this area is actually the secret medallion that we acquired earlier. If you bring it over to this lift and you switch actions to use the secret one instead, instead of being taken to the mountaintop of the Giants as normal, you'll be dropped off in the consecrated snowfield. Probably one of the, it's, it's literally like the rebirth of that worst area in, in Dark Souls 2. I mean, not really, but kind of. Anyways, the question is, why are we here? Why do we care about the Consecrated Snowfield? You get here using the Secret Medallion, but there's not a whole lot to do in the Consecrated Snowfield itself. However, this is key in accessing like three different main areas of the game. So firstly, when you get here and you get to the actual town all the way in the back, I'm going to leave a little link in the description on how to access Mikola's Halig Tree if you want to go there. This is where Melenia is located. She's an optional boss, but a lot of people want to fight her. I have a video I made in the description that is is a very straightforward guide on how to access the Halig Tree and how to get to Melenia. Very easy to do, but that'll give you access to that whole area of the game. Plus, you can get to Moog's Palace in different ways, but I think this is the easiest. Once you're in the snowfield, there's actually a secret teleporter all the way in like the left side, and I'll show you exactly how to get there from here. You'll need to go from the town, and then once you go all the way to the edge of the map, there's going to be this little portal tucked away in the back corner. When you enter this, you will now be in Mogwin Palace, and then you can make your your way through this area and get up top to where Moog himself is and this is the other thing that's required in accessing the DLC of the game when Shadow of the Earth Tree comes out it's going to be a requirement that you've defeated Moog and you have access to Mikola over here this is most likely where we're going to go to enter the DLC so at any point you want to play that content just make sure that you have Moog defeated in his palace and you can just come and go in this area whenever you feel like it but being able to access all of that I just mentioned it comes from being able to get the secret medallion so make sure you go out of your way to to get this very essential item but other than that you should have a very good understanding of the game a lot of good items talismans weapons and all of these key items that should help you take on the lands between and even then some so with this knowledge feel free to explore the game go respec your character to play with other weapons over at Renala. like whatever you want to do there's much you can get your hands in and that's where the fun of the game is to be found i wanted to show you how to play the game without spoiling literally everything but uh, a lot of enjoyment can be found just by you discovering stuff so go out on your own and enjoy your journey but i hope this did help leave a like on the video and consider subscribing for more souls content and more elden ring stuff i appreciate you guys watching and i'll see you all in the next one peace